Well, welcome everybody. I'm Ari Tuckman, and besides being the conference co-chair, I'm also a psychologist in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and I've written a few books, and I do a podcast, and when I'm lucky, I get to come out to cool places and present. So uh, what we're talking about today is something that I see a lot in my office. I have a lot of conversations about medication. Now, I'm a psychologist, so I don't prescribe, but I get a lot of people in my office coming for diagnosis of ADHD, coming for treatment of ADHD, and obviously medication is an established part of treatment, and yet a lot of people are kind of, I don't know, if not resistant, at least hesitant about it. So um, so what we're going to be talking about today is kind of that psychology of medication. What does it mean to have a condition that medication is used for, what does it mean if you choose to use medication? What does it mean if you choose not to use medication? So um, as a bit of a disclosure, what you will figure out very quickly from this presentation, if you haven't seen some of my other presentations, is that when it comes to ADHD, I actually I have a bias in favor of medication. And I say that because of the research that shows that it works and because of the people I see in my office and we'll go into some of those reasons, but just as a starting out point, I tend to prefer or I tend to recommend medication for not all of my folks with ADHD, but, but many of them, and I'll talk about the reasons why that is. Now, I have done some consulting for pharma companies that sell medications related to ADHD, but really, like, more than 95% of my income is from seeing clients in my office day after day, week after week. Like, that's really how I pay the bills. I make a few bucks on selling books. Writing books is a terrible way to make money, but there's a lot of other great things about it. Um, I make a small amount from pharma. Occasionally, I make some money by presenting somewhere, although often that kind of just covers my costs and allows me to go somewhere cool that I wouldn't be for that weekend otherwise. But um, so, you know, when it comes to the, consult the money that I've been um, paid by pharma companies, it it's small enough that if I didn't have it, I wouldn't feel it at all in my life. So, you know, the, the few bucks I've gotten from pharma doesn't really influence anything of what I'm doing here. So there's an interesting contradiction, then, in the world of ADHD. On the one hand, we have hundreds and thousands of studies that show that medication for ADHD is safe and extremely effective. So if you want to talk science, the science is very clear on this matter, particularly if you're talking about the stimulants. The non-stimulants, hmm, not a, they tend to not work as well for most people. But, uh, but the science is dead clear. There is no debate on the science of ADHD medication. Having said that, despite this clear, um, you know, black and white, clear, um, I don't know, scientific favoring of the effectiveness of medication, there's often this strong resistance that people have to the idea of taking medication for themselves or even more so putting their kid on medication. And I can understand, we're, you know, we're going to be protective of our kids, and that's not a bad thing. But, but there's this strong preference to not try medication or to do everything else first. You know, so we're going to do a complete elimination diet before we try medication. Good luck with the elimination diet. You almost have to be on medication in order to pull that thing off. <laughs> so when it comes to treatment for ADHD or whatever, um, there's no one-size-fits-all kind of solution. That ADHD, first of all, ADHD isn't always ADHD. It's not just ADHD. Like, one person's ADHD can look different than somebody else's ADHD. But also, ADHD is not all of who you are. There's all the rest of your life. There's all the rest of the supports. There's all the rest of the demands. There's all the rest of what goals do you have. If, if you're a student and you want A's, that's one sort of a thing. But if you're okay with B's and C's, well, I don't know. That's a whole other kind of a thing. So to say that everyone with ADHD needs medication is really, it's not a defensible statement, that it's really about making good choices based on what fits for you in your life or your child's life or your patients, your clients, your students' lives. So it's about really making well-informed, well-thought-out decisions. 
And as a psychologist, that is what I do all day. I help clients make well-thought-out, well-considered, well-informed decisions. So whether that is involves do I stay with my girlfriend or break up with her, whether it involves should I change jobs, whether it involves should I take medication, it's all the same stuff. We're talking about the same kinds of things. So we want these decisions to be good ones that work for the particular person involved and that they fit their circumstances. And we'll talk about what those different circumstances might be that will influence somebody one way or the other, but that also fix, fit their goals and their values. So, so therefore, like that's really the goal of everything I'm doing every hour all day, and that's the goal when we talk about ADHD medication as well. Now, in order to talk about medication or anything, uh, there is a difference between facts and opinions. Like these are not the same thing. Having an opinion and writing it on the internet does not equal a fact, right? And but often facts and opinions get confused. And when they get confused, we tend to make worse decisions. So let's define some terms here. Facts are objectively accurate and verifiable information. So this is not just what you believe, but this is something that if you checked it out, if you tested it out, you would get the same thing again. So for example, somebody's height is a fact. Now, whether we believe that they're tall or not, well, that's more subjective. But like, if this is their height, 10 people will get roughly that same height if they measured them. That is a factual kind of a thing. So an example of a fact, then, is that more people with ADHD benefit from stimulants than non-stimulants. If we ran a bunch of studies, which have been done, um, that gets found rather robustly and clearly. So now that doesn't tell me about you or your kid or your student or your client or patient because, you know, the group doesn't always tell about the individual. But as a general statement, that is a factual kind of a thing. Now, by contrast, opinions, opinions are a little bit different. So opinions are positions that, that we hold that are based on personal preferences and how we interpret the facts. So how tall somebody is, how, if we, how tall we feel they are, if someone's six foot, six feet even, let's say, and you're five feet even, they're pretty tall. But if you're six five, eh, they're not that tall, right? The facts haven't changed. That height has not changed. But whether you feel they're tall or not kind of depends. And of course, every time you know you haven't seen a kid for a while, and then you see them again, and they've grown, you're like, oh, you're so much, you're so big now. Well, I don't know. They don't think they're any bigger. Right, so that's where the facts and opinions get a little bit messy. So, um, so as an example of an opinion is that I personally believe that it's often worth trying medication for ADHD if somebody is struggling enough, just to see what it's going to do. So the best decisions then are those where we combine facts with opinions, that we bring the two together to make the best decision for us individually in that circumstance. So unfortunately, bad decisions arise when we take an opinion and believe it to be a fact. So for example, if someone says, well, stimulant medication is addictive. I don't want my kid to be a drug addict. If they believe that that is a factual statement, that they believe that that's an accurate statement, that's going to clearly have a negative effect on their willingness to consider medication. Now, the problem is that's not an accurate statement. So if someone said, I don't want my kid to take stimulant medication because, you know, it makes them purple, well, that doesn't happen either, and we would probably encourage them to reconsider that as a reason not to try medication. So how's that any different then if someone says, no, I don't want my kid to be a drug addict? By contrast, good decisions are based in the facts, but they're guided by people's opinions and their preferences. So the facts then are universal, but the opinions are personal. And in order to come up with the best solution to a problem, we really need both. So my job then as a psychologist is to, first of all, give my clients good facts, 
help them understand what is indeed accurate to correct some inaccuracies. But then they make their own decision based on their own personal circumstances. But again, if they're using inaccurate information, my job is to correct some of that information. Their job is to then decide what to do with it. So before we even talk about treatment, let's talk a little bit about diagnosis. Because of course, you gotta start with a diagnosis before you, you know what to do about it. So there are two truths when it comes to diagnosis. The first is that accurate diagnosis guides effective treatment. If you get the diagnosis wrong, your treatment is much less likely to be effective. That's equally likely of ADHD. So if someone doesn't know ADHD or didn't look for it and they make a diagnosis of depression and then they start using CBT for depression, if they start using an uh, SSRI antidepressant, not likely to be effective. But as my wife unfortunately found out, um, when you bring your car to the shop, by which I mean when your car gets towed to the shop because it wouldn't start, and they replace the starter, and then you drive home, and two days later, your car does not start again, turns out the diagnosis of bad starter was not what the problem was. And the treatment of, here's a new starter, doesn't solve your problem. So whether it's mental health, medical health, car repair, why is my roof leaking, why doesn't my computer do this thing I want it to do, Good diagnosis is always where it begins. Or as a saying I heard, um, a problem well-defined is a problem half-solved. And a lot of times, this is more true for the adults than, than the kids these days, but a lot of times by the time an adult shows up in my office, they've gotten some wrong diagnoses along the way. Whether that diagnosis is you're just anxious or depressed, or the diagnosis is you're not trying hard enough, Right, that's a diagnosis. It's not the right one, as it turns out. But um, you know, they've had the wrong diagnoses, and therefore they've had the wrong treatments. So just the act of making an accurate diagnosis is often therapeutic all by itself. And that moment of understanding of oh, that's why. Da da, da 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 That moment of clarity when it all comes together and someone gets a diagnosis of ADHD for themselves or their kid or whatever, and all of a sudden now it makes sense in a way that it never did before. A second truth is that good self-knowledge is a crucial component to, sustain, to sustained success. And that's true for all of us. If you know yourself well, how, what am I good at? What do I struggle with? The things that I don't do as well, what are my workarounds? Or if I have to write a paper, if I'm a student, what's the best way for me to write a paper? If I have to do this, what's the best way for me to do it? And sometimes it's just, you know, it, it's dumb little things. So, like, I, just as a random disclosure, like, I have no sense of, like, what colors go with what colors. I remember, like, this, this goes with that, but that doesn't go with that. So, literally, I'll do this where, my wife, if before I go to a conference, I'll, my wife and I will assemble some outfits. I'll lay them out on my bed and I'll literally take a picture. Because the thing of like, wear this shirt with this tie, this was much worse when I wore suits and now I'm just bailed out on that. But I could, so I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to remember. I'm like, ugh, which tie is that? And so I literally take a picture of it, of all the outfits assembled. And then I look at the picture in the morning and be like, okay, this shirt and this tie. And then this one year, like, Four years ago for the Chad conference, I was supposed to fly out on Friday. My flight got canceled for Friday. I got a call on Thursday. Tomorrow's flight is canceled. They're going to book me on Saturday. And then I was going to, like, miss the, my presentation. So I scrambled, got a flight out on Saturday, grabbed a bunch of stuff. I can probably match, like, shirts and suits, but ties is, like, a whole nother. That's, like, varsity level. That's, like, beyond me. So I just, like, grabbed a few ties. And I was like, well, one of these should work. And I threw it in the suitcase. And I flew out of here, and I was like, all right, I'm just going to find some woman, and I'm going to ask her. So, so I went to breakfast, found some women I knew, and I was like, okay, which of these three ties is the one? And luckily, one of them was a good one. So, um, you know, so for all of us, the better you know yourself, the more likely you're going to put yourself into the right situations, the ones that are going to work well for you, and the more likely you are to make whatever situation you're in, including the ones you'd rather not be in, 
to be more effective, to work out better for you, however you define better. Now, there are some who are resistant to the idea of diagnosis because they feel like diagnosis and treatment are like one and the same thing, that once they get diagnosed, then that's it, that they have to then start taking medication as if they're going to come to my office and see me, and I'm going to say, yep, turns out you have ADHD. I'm now legally required to make you go down the hall and see Burton, and he's going to give you some Adderall, right? As if, like, these things have to happen one and two right after the other. But what you do with a diagnosis is a completely different question than getting the diagnosis. So getting the diagnosis just helps you understand what the situation is. But the diagnosis just helps us understand what are the treatment options? What does one typically do in this kind of a situation? Here are the pros and cons of this. Here are the pros and cons of that. Here are other things you can do. Da 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 da. Ta da, there's your menu, make your choices. And also, like, here is the likelihood of this. Here's the likelihood this is going to work. Here's the likelihood that's going to work. Now, on the flip side of that, there are those who want to try medication just to see what it does. Well, I'm going to try some of my kids' Concerta. You know, he seems to do better on it. Let's see what it does for me. Now, that's not really recommended either, because without the diagnosis, you don't want to jump to the treatment. Um, but it creates an interesting thing where just because somebody does a little bit better on a stimulant does not mean that they have ADHD. As those of us who enjoy coffee or require coffee know, we all do better on a stimulant. The difference is... Some people do this much better on a stimulant, and some people do this much better. And these are the folks who have ADHD, and these are the folks who don't. Except some of the people do this with ADHD. They just don't do that much better. So not responding to a stimulant also doesn't tell us about the diagnosis. Because it could be the dose was too low. could be the dose was too high. It could be this is just not the right medication, but maybe another one would be. So we always want to start with diagnosis before we jump into treatment. Just like when you take your car to the shop, hopefully they're not just randomly replacing parts on you, or at least charging you for those parts. You know, like hopefully they're going to figure out what the problem is before they start fixing things. Now, unfortunately, there's this kind of interesting kind of duality or contradiction in the sense that psychological conditions, so anything that's like up in your head, are often seen as somehow being different than medical conditions. And so if you have diabetes, nobody is going to say, you know, if you tried a little bit harder to produce insulin, I'm, not, I'm just sort of saying, I think, I don't know. I think I, I have this friend who has a cousin, and they tried harder to make insulin, and it, and it really worked for them. So, you know. Now, the implication here is that if it really is just about willpower, if ADHD is just about trying harder, what does it mean if you are not doing well? Guess you're not trying hard enough. Or maybe you're just not that smart. Maybe that's the answer, right? So there's something a little kind of insidious about that idea that you just need to try harder which kind of brings, me, brings up, um, Ross Green has this great quote where he says, kids do well when they can, but we could say people do well when they can, because doing well is always better than doing badly. Why would somebody choose to make their life harder? Like, is anyone really going to say, yeah, I could do better in my life, but nah, I don't really feel like it. I'll, I'll take the negative consequences. Bring them on. That's fine. I mean, I suppose there are a few people out there who kind of like fear success or don't believe they're worthy or something, but there's not that many people that we could say that about. So as a result, there's often a lot less stigma about having what's seen as a medical condition. And yet we know ADHD is clearly a brain-based kind of a thing. That sounds sort of medical to me, right? Oh, there's genetics involved? Hmm, that sounds pretty medical also. And yet somehow, because it affects how we think and how we feel and what we do, we have this unreasonable idea that then it's just about willpower and it's just about decisions. And it's really not that simple. So there are those who refuse to accept a diagnosis, whether for themselves or their kid. Um, you know, they just don't believe in the diagnosis in general. And 
there's a few reasons for why this happens. So one of them is that some people, they just don't understand ADHD. What do you mean? I'm not hyperactive. I don't have ADHD. Well, okay, that's fine. But, you know, first of all, you're 40, so you're not going to be hyperactive now, most likely. Or there's also this thing called the inattentive type who were never hyperactive. So you could still have ADHD even though you don't have the H, for example. But part of that also is that some people just have poor self-awareness, by which I mean 15-year-old boys with ADHD, right? How are you doing? Fine. Everything's great. Hey, mom, how's he doing? Oh, my God. How long do we have? Right? I'll be fine. You, if you just left me alone and gave me space, I would get better grades. The problem is you're nagging me all the time. That is why I'm getting bad grades. You keep bugging me about it. Hmm. Okay. That's one, that's one interpretation. I don't think history supports that idea. But um, So some people just, they don't get it. They don't have good self-awareness. They don't realize how forgetful they are. They don't realize how much they get distracted. And if you lie detector them, if you gave them a stack of Bibles, they would swear up and down, I'm fine. I don't forget things. Well, okay, fine, but maybe not more than anyone else. Okay, well, maybe just a little bit more, but seriously, that's all. That's as far as I'm going to go. On the other hand, there's some people who believe that accepting the diagnosis, saying like, okay, fine, maybe that is true about me or my kid, um, means that there's something kind of inherently flawed about them, that there's, it's kind of a bit of a black and white way of looking at it, that either you are fine or there's something bad about you, as opposed to seeing it as kind of more of a dimensional trait, just like height, you know, there's like this bell curve, just like, I don't know, perceptual awareness, there's a bell curve, just like musical ability, there's a bell curve, athletic ability. All this ADHD stuff in terms of attention and, you know, impulse resistance and executive functions, there is a bell curve, as we've seen through, I don't know, all of the keynotes maybe, um, and lots of other presentations, there's a bell curve. And some people are on this side of it, and some people are on that side of it, most people are in this fat part in the middle. So it's not bad or good, it's about a little bit more or a little bit less. On the other hand, there are those who see the diagnosis really as kind of a liberating explanation. You know, it's that moment of clarity. It's when the clouds part and the beam of sunlight comes down and the angels start to sing, where it's like, ah, oh, that's why. It's like all of a sudden it's a vindication for all those past struggles and all that confusion and all that, like, why am I so smart over here? I do these knucklehead things over there. Or I got an A in math this year, but I was getting a C last year. What's wrong with me? Well, you got a much better teacher this year who's much more interesting um, or whatever. So let's talk then briefly about the difference between excuses and explanations. Because if you're going to talk about diagnosis and then you're going to talk about treatment, if something is just seen as an excuse, it's a bit of a game stopper right there, you know? So... Excuses then, lower expectations for someone. Well, you know, he'll do some of his homework. Or, yeah, she's never really on time. What are you going to do? But the problem with that, as much as it's nice to get a free pass sometimes, the problem with overusing excuses is that they're ultimately limiting because they depend on other people's willingness to do the excusing. So you might have a boss who says, well, okay, she's never on time, but... You know what, she does good work when she comes, she works through lunch, she stays late, whatever, I'm not going to make a thing of it. Awesome. Until you get another job. Until that reorg happens and you have a different boss, and now you haven't changed, but your boss has, and how they feel about your lateness sure has. So, you know, it can create a situation where someone then might recognize, you know what, I am terrible at getting to work on time. If I go for another job, even though I've really sort of outgrown this one, I don't know, man, that might not work out so well. And I got to say, that's not like depressive exaggeration of potential struggles. That's actually a rather reasonable assessment of reality. So there are people who will stay in a, in a, I don't know, inferior job, a job that they would rather not be in because of this, because they recognize the fact that if they can't get it together with getting to work on time, or whatever other million examples, 
that's actually not a bad idea to stay in a job that you know you can do well and that you have a boss who's forgiving in this particular area of weakness. Now, by contrast, explanations then offer an understanding for why something is happening. And based on understanding the why, we can therefore know what to do about it. So that person who's struggling to get to work on time, if they don't really know about ADHD and it just sort of seems like despite good effort and good intentions and I swear this year is going to be different and all that, nothing gets different. But if they understand like, oh, ADHD, that's why it's hard for me to get to bed on time. That's why it's hard for me to wind down so that I can fall asleep. That's why it's hard for me to get out of bed and just go A, B, C, D, bam, out the door. Oh, now I understand. Now I can do something different about it. So that person may still choose to stay in the job that they're in, but now has the option perhaps to go to a different job. That's a whole different ball game. And if, I'm, if I got to pick one of those two scenarios, I'll definitely pick the second. So the good news is that you know, knowledge is power. You have that information, now you can do something good with it. The bad news is now you, perhaps you should do something with it. You know, so with power comes responsibility. Let's talk about some myths then. We've got to start with the myths about ADHD medication. And when I say ADHD medication, really what I'm talking about is stimulants. There's less bias against the non-stimulants. So here are some myths that are at best overstatements, but at worst are really just downright inaccurate. So the first one is that the stimulants are addictive. Now that's potentially a true statement. If you crush up and snort your Adderall, dude, that is totally going to be addictive. But let's be clear on who we should blame in that scenario. The problem is not Adderall at that point. The problem is you are misusing Adderall. Now, by the same token, if you're texting and driving, I don't think we can blame your cell phone, right? So let's be clear about where responsibility lies and therefore where the point of intervention is. If you take Adderall or Concerta or Vyvanse or whatever, if you take it at the doses you're supposed to, and you actually have ADHD, by the way, it is not addictive. You do not become addicted to it. Your doses do not escalate over time the way that it does if you're using something in an addictive way. If you're overusing something, then our body's tolerance mechanism kicks in, and it takes more and more and more and more to get that same experience. By contrast, people who are on the right dose of medication, they can be on the same dose for five years or 10 years, and they're not getting a rush off of it. Um, some people believe that stimulants cause irreparable side effects. I got an email from this guy who's a teacher. He's like in his mid-20s, ADHD, and you know, he, wanted, he was looking for some treatment. You know, he didn't want to try medication, though, because he heard that they were unhealthy. Well, they're not. On the other hand, I'd say bad eating habits, not getting enough sleep, stressing out all the time, not doing well at work, struggling in your relationships, those sound a little unhealthy also. And we'll talk about kind of the flip side of this, of what, what's the price paid to not treat something. There's some people who say that the stimulants are overprescribed. So first of all, that's not entire, that's not just, you know, looking at population data, that's not completely accurate. Certainly not for adults. If anything, there are way more adults with ADHD out there who are undiagnosed and therefore untreated. Um, when it comes to kids, there are definitely kids with AD or without ADHD who have been mistakenly put on stimulants. So I'm certainly not going to say that's a good idea. But again, like good diagnosis. Let's get the diagnosis right. Um, but here's the thing. If there are 20 people who don't have ADHD, who have been mistakenly diagnosed it and given medication, what does that, like, what does that tell us about you? Like, if you actually have ADHD, shouldn't treatment be an option for you? Like, why does the other, if other people are being overprescribed, why does that mean that you shouldn't be? Right? Like, that doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, if you're doing, like, big public policy stuff or you're funding out, you're figuring out, like, you know, what's our budget for this year for Medicaid or something, maybe that has something. You know, we're going to pay for this many prescriptions. But for an individual, whether other people are appropriately prescribed or inappropriately prescribed, that has no bearing on what happens to you. 
right? We want each individual person to get the right treatment in the right way. Some people say that medication is used to control kids. Well, maybe it's, it's being used to control some kids who are out of control. And by control, it's not the parents or the teachers who are controlling them, but it gives the kids or the adult more control over their own actions. I don't know, that seems like kind of a good thing to me, as opposed to the kids who are getting in trouble who don't want to be in trouble. There's this physician in Alabama, this guy, John Bailey, who collected quotes from patients, like all these kind of funny and poignant quotes. And one of them was from a kid who says, um, my pill makes my mom stop yelling at me. <laughs> hmm, that's interesting. His pill changes her behavior. I wonder, if there's a, I wonder if there's a mediating variable in there. Is there something different that he's doing maybe that might influence what she's doing differently? Um, some people think that it gives people an unfair advantage. It's like cheating to take stimulant medication. Hmm, I'm not sure quite how that works. I don't know, taking somebody else's glasses doesn't help you see better if it's not the right prescription. So, you know, that's just one of those, like, they just don't understand ADHD or medication. Uh, and then there are those who feel that natural remedies are superior and safer. Now, it's your choice to try other things, alternative treatments, whatever. But as a factual statement, scientifically speaking, this is inaccurate. Natural remedies have not been found to be effective for ADHD in general, and certainly not more effective than the stimulants. Folks with ADHD untreated can be a little bit more kind of divergent thinkers. But, you know, so on the one hand, it can help with creativity to be, have like different thoughts about a situation or for to let your mind kind of go different places. But the problem is there's creativity and there's productivity. So you can have lots of interesting ideas in your head, but if you can't actualize them, if you can't do something with it, if you can't finish that creative thing that you're doing, then I don't know, that maybe doesn't round up to better, that might round down to worse, you know what I mean? Um, so I guess, you know, the advice that I would give to someone is to try it out, see if it makes a difference. You know, am I less creative on the medication? Or am I not? Does it help me kind of get more of that stuff done or doesn't it? And, you know, at least if we're talking about the stimulants, they go in quickly and they go out quickly. So it's very easy to see what the difference is on them versus off of them. And if you don't like how they're working when they're working, then shortly enough, they're out of your system. So reasons why people don't try medication. Some people don't see the need. And either that's because they don't see how ADHD is negatively affecting them, partially maybe because a parent or a spouse or someone is, you know, over-functioning in, the, in these particular areas. Sometimes, and, you know, this is a more legitimate reason, is that it's like, you know what, I'm fine with the way my life is. And if you're actually fine with it, then I'm fine with that. You know, I don't believe there's one way to live your life. But if you're unhappy about certain things, but you don't want to change the things that are causing some of that unhappiness, that doesn't work as well. You know, there's a mismatch there between your goals and your methods, and you got to change either your methods or your goals. Um, some people, like I said before, are kind of resistant to accepting the diagnosis, and if you resist the diagnosis, then the treatment isn't going to follow. Some people don't want to become dependent on it. Now, like we said before about the addictive thing, you know, like that's not entirely accurate. And you know, there's more nuances on that dependency thing. So other people prefer, they, it's kind of like, I want to exhaust every other option before I try medication. For some people, it's a matter of expense, and especially if they have crummy insurance coverage or they can't find a doctor, there's nobody nearby who knows what they're doing. Um, you know, like that, those are logistical reasons and those are valid. Unfortunately, those are valid. Or there's co-occurring conditions or interactions. So if someone has like, I don't know, insufficiently managed seizures or bipolar disorder or cardiac issues, then stimulants really legitimately may not be a reasonable option for them. If somebody starts it, sometimes they discontinue it, um, by which I mean often they're discontinued. Bill Dodson did a pre-con on Thursday where he, he showed this slide where um, 
of how many people of looking at adults and how many of them refilled prescriptions. And nine months out, 15% of them were still taking their medication. By which I mean 85% were not refilling their prescriptions nine months out. So the discontin discontinuation rate is extremely high. Now, often, besides the fact that, you know, there's that inconsistency of ADHD and the forgetfulness and the forgetting the appointment and forgetting to get a refill and all of that, I think some of that also reflects the fact that um, some of them are not on the right medication. They're not on good medication. So they're on super low doses from their primary care doc who then doesn't bring it up to the to a good level. Or they're on the wrong medication, so they get put on like Wellbutrin, which is an antidepressant because it's safer, but it doesn't do nearly half as much as what the stimulants do, or whatever. They're just not on the right medication. It's hard to make a compelling case to keep taking something that's not very effective. Um, for some of them, you know, the insurance coverage changes. I had, lunch, I had breakfast this morning with my uncle, who's a psychiatrist in the area, and he was talking about he has patients on one medication because that's what's the, what the plan covers. And then the next year, they rejigger the formulary, and now this one isn't covered. And instead, you got to take that one. And now you're, like, back at it again, trying to figure out, because they can't. this one is no longer covered. So the one that is, let's see if we can get that one to work. For some people, they just want to learn to do it themselves. Like, when my son was a baby, we had this babysitter who was just an awesome person, um, had ADHD, had medication, which she hardly ever took. And I remember once I was talking to her about it. She was driving me to the airport, probably to come to Chad. And um, she was saying, like, yeah, you know, I'm not going to be on my parents' insurance coverage forever. This was before Obamacare changed that. And, you know, so I'm not going to have medication, so I, I need to learn how to do it on my own. And it's like that she fundamentally doesn't understand that. But, no, that's not how this works. You know, this will not just... It's not just about learning good habits. This will not change on its own. So what medication does then for those with ADHD is that it increases the activity in certain parts of the brain, most likely related to executive functions, to attention, to impulse control. And it helps people be more consistent, more reliable, more planful, more timely. Um, or another way of putting it is it enables people with ADHD to better apply the rest of their good abilities and the rest to make their good work result more consistently in what they want it to. Or as I sometimes say, um, well, I sometimes say that ADHD is a disorder of actualizing good intentions. So what the medication does is it closes that gap between intentions and actions. Sure, honey, I'll pick up milk on the way home. Or I'm going to sit down and I'm going to read. I got to crank out this, you know, this reading. I got to get this done so I can be prepared for tomorrow's, you know, client meeting. Whether there, it's an intention given to someone else or an intention of their own, medication helps folks with ADHD more consistently do that stuff that they intend to do, or at least not fall short any more than the rest of us. I often I have this saying that I use often with clients, which is that performance is a function of demands versus abilities. So the higher the demands, the more your performance might struggle. The higher your abilities, probably the better you'll do. So it's that relative balance between demands and abilities. So if we want to improve performance, we can worth both work both sides of that, demands and the abilities. So on the one hand, we can lower the demands. The lower the demands, the better the person will perform. So if someone struggles with being distracted, well, let's eliminate some distractions if we can. Um, if you have trouble remembering everything you need to do, write a list. If you have trouble remembering what the homework is, maybe the kid sitting next to you will remind you. Or maybe you reach out to a friend to find out what the homework is. Or maybe you ask your romantic partner to remind you of something. So we're reducing the demands on what you need to do. The other possibility is that we can increase somebody's abilities, and certainly medication is one of those ways of increasing abilities. But there's also the whole matter of, um, you know, as the saying goes, pills don't teach skills. So finding good habits, using a calendar, making a point of setting reminders in your phone, making a point of, 
kind of bouncing back when something doesn't work out. So not getting caught in a negative spiral of beating on yourself and, you know, avoiding the thing that you need to deal with. We can also sort of increase abilities, which is not really true, by, but by getting more sleep, which is not an ADHD strength, shall we say, um, eating well and exercising often. Obviously, everybody does better when they manage those better. Now, you're not going to be more than you can be if you get enough sleep, eat well, and exercise, but you'll at least be as good as you can be. Or another way of putting it is you won't be less than you can be. So on the one hand, we don't have to use medication to increase your abilities. It really depends on what your performance goals are. So the simplest example of this is, you know, if, if you want A's and B's because you're going for a certain level of college, then that's fine, like that's good, but you're going to need to do some things to improve your abilities to get there. On the other hand, if you're fine with C's, I don't know, you don't have, maybe you don't have to take medication if you're okay with C's. Not that it's just about grades, but it's just a simple example to use. So when it comes then to making a decision about treatment, whatever that treatment might be, um, your personal circumstances are important. It matters. So on the one hand, research tells us, you know, the probability of effectiveness of something. So stimulants tend to work between, you know, Adderall or Concerta. Stimulants tend to work for about 85% of people with ADHD. So generally speaking, that, you know, it tends to work for most people. Some of the non-stimulants like Stratera work for about half of people with ADHD. So it tells us the probabilities. But it's also one of those things that if, so on the one hand, I like those odds, but, you know, if it's one in a million, somebody's the one, right? Now the odds are against it, but somebody is still the one in a million. So the probabilities don't tell us totally, but they tell us generally. So we're going to use that as a way um, of kind of informing our decisions. So therefore, probably a wise thing to do is to start with the things that are most likely to work. And as an example, if you can't find your car keys, you should probably not start by looking in the attic. It's possible they, that you left them in the attic. It's much more likely you left them in the living room. Now, who knows? It may be that like, oh, you know what? I was in the attic. You know what? I, was, I moved some boxes up there. Yeah, I forgot. That, that is, lo and behold, yep, right next to the attic stairs, there they are. But what are the odds that they're going to be there versus the odds that they're going to be in the living room? So seriously, let's start by looking in the living room. In the same way, if we're talking about doing something about ADHD, maybe we should start with the things that are most likely to work. I mean, you can do whatever you want, but let's start with the things probably wise course is to start with the things that are most likely to work. Now, but that's generally speaking, but we all have specific circumstances. So... Um, if somebody is about, if they're, you know, looking at failing this semester, I don't know, we may be a little bit more, I won't use aggressive, I'm a little more assertive. We might sort of push things a little bit quicker. If someone's about to get fired, they're on probation at work. We might be a little more inclined to really, like, get things going here. On the other hand, if it's really not that bad, or let's say it's, you know, June 15th, School just ended. We got two and a half months to figure this out before the next semester begins. Well, I don't know. We can take our time a little bit more there, right? So it's, as much as there are like standard protocols, it also depends on the circumstances. Or let's say someone has serious addiction, like serious substance abuse going on right now, and they have a history of abusing their ADHD meds. Are we going to be throwing a bunch of stimulants at that person? I don't know, probably not, at least not, we're not giving them the bottle. I was talking to somebody yesterday, well, maybe in that case you give the parents the bottle, even though this person's 25. Maybe that's the solution. I don't know, it depend, again, it depends on the individual circumstances. Um, the value that something has is based on the benefits versus the costs. So is it worth it? Relative to the alternatives, is it worth it? So we can change the math on how much something is worth by either increasing the benefits, helping it work better, 
or decreasing the costs, reducing some of the side effects, reducing the copay, reducing the drive to the physician, um, whatever. You know, so we can kind of work both sides of that to come to a better value. But when we look at the potential benefits of something, of a medication, and when we look at the side effects, we need to consider not just what are the costs of treating, we also need to consider what are the costs of not treating. And often, when people are really kind of against the idea of ADHD medication, they're not looking at that other half of the equation. So that what they say is, I don't want my kid on meds, or I don't want to be on that stuff. But they're not looking at like, but then why did you show up in my office in the first place? Let's talk about that. All the reasons, all the struggles that they're having about it. So, you know, the example that I give then is if you looked at the side effects for chemotherapy, almost nobody would sign on for it because that stuff can be pretty terrible. You know what's worse? Dying of cancer in three months. Well, I got two crappy options there. Which one is is less bad? Depending upon, it's probably, but not necessarily, but it's probably slugging through the chemotherapy. So by the same token, you can't just look at, I don't like the idea of my kid on meds, or I don't like the side effects, and then just say, that's it. You know, you need to consider both sides of it. And there are clients I've had where the medication doesn't give enough good and it gives too much bad. And in that case, yeah, like I can buy into their decision not to take it. But, but again, it's that fully informed, fully thought out decision that we're looking at. Now, the more complex way then of assessing what medication is doing, like whether it's worth it, depends on how you define success. Um, so on the one hand, success depends not only on how effective something was, but how effective were you expecting it to be? And I see this kind of go both ways. So on the one hand, I have clients who've been on totally suboptimal doses for like a year by the time they come into my office. It's doing very little for them, but they weren't expecting much anyway, so that's why they're still taking it a year later, or sporadically at least they're still taking it. Um, so in those cases, they should have expected more. They didn't know it, and it, I don't blame them. I blame the person who prescribing should have informed them, here's what we're looking for. Um, but in other cases, it's this thing where, you know, they take three pills and it hasn't cured every problem in their life, and they see it as a failure. You know, and I have those people too. Like, oh, I took the medication, I still don't feel like doing my math homework. Yeah, no crap. You're never going to want to do your math homework. That's not about medication. That's about the fact that you hate math. There is no medication that will change that. So having the right expectations makes it more likely that you're going to feel that it's successful when it actually is effective. It also depends on what costs and side effects are acceptable. So like, you know, as you were saying with some of the kids you see that they don't feel, you know, they feel that they're not as fun. Now, my guess is that when you take that hyperactive, impulsive kid with ADHD and you put him on medication, probably that kid's friends don't think he's as funny. I have a feeling his teachers have a different opinion about how, how important funny is. Um, but there's also the issue of, is it the kind of, as you were saying, is it the funny that this kid wants? Because it may be that he's being funny, but it's, they're not laughing with, they're laughing at. But it also depends on what are you looking for in terms of benefits and side effects. So if someone is a little bit less social, and that's the thing that they're focusing on, this is especially true of kids and teens, then they may ignore the fact that they're getting better grades, or they're getting in trouble less, or there's less kind of strife at home. Because that's not the thing that they care the most about. So that's not where they're they're not seeing the benefits. So they're like, I don't know, it's not really doing anything. And their parents are like, holy moly, this makes a big difference. So they're looking for different things when they're evaluating how effective it is. But regardless of whether you, someone takes medication or not, hard work is still always a crucial, a necessary but not sufficient ingredient in success. What the medication does, though, is it enables you to better apply those efforts in more productive ways to get done the things that matter to you, possibly also that matter to other people, maybe sometimes more than you, as in 
grades or getting places on time, but but it, it's a way of getting done the stuff that you want to get done. So there are some people then who have this kind of idea that like, if I take medication and it helps me do better, then is that me? Like, do I get credit for that? Or is that really just the medication that gets credit for that? And like, I, I understand the idea, like it's an interesting philosophical question, but you know, when I'm wearing my contact lenses and I can see better as I drive and I can see cars further ahead more clearly, when I get home safely without crashing into anything, I don't say, boy, those contacts really did a great job driving home today, right? I mean, it was me and my abilities. Now, if I'm using my contact lenses instead of seeing cars to look around and to see everything that's going by, that's not a matter of contact lenses. That's a matter of, like, I'm not making good choices behind the wheel. So... Um, so what the medication does is it just enables people with ADHD to more consistently apply their abilities and more predictably do the stuff that they intend to do. So it's your abilities, your efforts, and therefore your successes. There are a lot of people who, you know, the sort of anti-medication people or the anti-ADHD people kind of get on their high horse about like, oh, stimulant medication, performance enhancing, blah, blah, blah. Is there anybody in this room who does not use caffeine? All right, so there's like two two people. And I, okay, this is perhaps a select subset of the population, but I guarantee you if we went to any of the other rooms in this hotel or if we went to the whatever hotel next door, we wouldn't get different numbers. People use stimulants in all sorts of ways in terms of caffeine and nicotine and other stuff and alcohol and, you know, all, you know, like we use things that change how we think, feel, and perform. But most people tend to not get that sort of uptight about that as a performance enhancer. So it raises a question then, and I'm not saying we should put Ritalin in the drinking water, but it raises a question then of like, really, how is it that these prescribed stimulants are different morally than some of these other things that we use? So let's talk about dependency, because this is kind of a common thing that comes up, that there are some people who feel that... They don't like the idea of taking medication because they don't want to become dependent on it. Now, when they say dependent, really what they're meaning is addicted. So there's a difference, though. Addictive dependency creates a situation where you need more and more and more of something in order to function at the same level. Clearly, that's problematic. Like, I understand why someone doesn't want to fall into that. But the difference is that addictive dependency makes your life smaller. So let's use alcohol as an example. If you're drinking more and more and more, you're probably doing less and less and less of other things. Now, nah, I don't want to go there. They're not going to have anything to drink. Let's go to this other place instead. Or you're not hanging out with certain people because when you start to get hammered, they're not so, so psyched about it. Right? So your life is getting smaller and smaller. You're spending more and more time, more and more mental energy on that thing that you're addicted to. Clearly, that's problematic. By contrast, I would say medication for ADHD, when it's the right thing and taken in the right way, makes somebody's life bigger. It makes it bigger and more interesting. So in the same way that having contact lenses makes my life bigger and more interesting. I can do everything inside my house without my contact lenses. I can see the TV, I can see whatever I'm doing, no problem. The problem is I wanna be able to leave my house and drive myself and I wanna be able to see things that are far away. I could live an okay life without that, but I live a much better life with my contact lenses. Same deal when the power goes out. Are you dependent on electricity in an addictive kind of a way? Not really, but you figure out really fast how life is better with electricity or with a charged cell phone or cell service or whatever. We have lots, or when your car is in the shop, you figure out how dependent you are on having a car. It makes your life mostly um, a better thing. So we're not addicted to cars and cell phones and electricity but we're dependent on having them in order to have the kind of life that we want. So it's really not that different then in terms of the medication. If you want to function at this level, 
if you want your life to look this kind of a way, medication is probably a necessary component of that. Now, it, it's okay if you want it to look something some other way. That's fine. And then you don't have to have the medication. But, you know, you, you got to pick kind of one or the other. My goal then in all of this is, like I keep saying, is to kind of fully inform the decision. And there are some people who feel that trying medication is this thing that like permanently changes them. Like if I make that choice to try medication one time, then I'm forever different. It's kind of like getting a tattoo. If you're gonna get, like tattoos are awesome if you like them, but here's the thing, if you're gonna get a tattoo, make it a good tattoo. Like make it a tattoo you're gonna be happy about for a very long time. Trying medication is not like getting a tattoo. You try it, you see what it does, and then you decide tomorrow whether you take it again. And then you decide the next day whether you take it again, and you decide the next day whether you, and every day is a new choice about taking or not taking medication. So it doesn't need to be this big momentous decision. So if you try it, then it's better to know. And not just one time, one dose, but to try it and to really kind of get the medication as good as it can be, which might mean trying more than one. So if somebody decides to try medication, you know, we want them to get it right. Um, and I've certainly had plenty of people who've tried medication, wasn't the right stuff by a prescriber who probably didn't know what they were doing. And they're really against medication, but that's kind of like, I don't know, it's like going to a, a terrible Mexican restaurant that does a really bad job. You wouldn't say, therefore, all Mexican food is terrible. I don't like Mexican food. It's that I don't like bad Mexican food. Good Mexican food, awesome. So you don't go to one place and then forever write the rest off. Um, so if you're going to try medication, you want a prescriber who knows what they're doing and follows kind of standard protocols. Um, that might mean that you have to try more than one. It almost certainly means you got to try more than one dose. Highly unlikely that the very first dose you try is the one that you're going to do the best on. You probably got to work your way up. You might have to try more than one medication because sometimes, you know, people can have a different response to one medication than they do to another. Even within families where mom's taking this one and does great, but the kid's taking this one and does completely different. So. If you try medication, don't change a lot of other things at once. If you're changing too many things at once, we don't know what's causing what. We want to pay attention not only to the benefits, but also to the side effects, which is also, or alternatively, we want to pay attention not only to the side effects, but also to the benefits. Like we want both. Um, I'll often recommend, even for adults, that they bring a second person to the appointments, definitely for young adults and teenagers. You know, you want the parental input on that. But it's just a good idea. I mean, our romantic partners notice things about us that we don't notice about ourselves. Like, that's true for all of us. So um, that's kind of a helpful thing to have that other person along. Um, and then also to manage your lifestyle well. I've had a bunch of folks who, who come in and they say, yeah, meds just aren't working that well anymore. I don't know. Maybe I need to change it. Then we talk for a few minutes, and it turns out they're getting like five hours of sleep. And then they're like, oh, yeah, ah, that's probably the thing. Okay, let me, let me do that and then we'll see. So natural remedies. There's all sorts of stuff out there that claims to be effective for ADHD. And, um, you know, so natural remedies, brain training programs, whatever, whatever. So um, in terms of natural remedies, if you look at the facts of it, by which I mean if you look at the research that's been done, as of yet... There has not been any research that's found any of these natural remedies to be effective. So dietary changes, supplements, nutraceuticals, whatever, 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 none of that stuff has any decent research that shows that it's effective. Um, mindfulness training, maybe, and that's certainly like, like who would you not recommend mindfulness training to? So that's kind of like an easy thing to recommend. Um, mindfulness seems to have some benefits. Certainly exercise seems to have some benefits. Maybe, possibly, perhaps, like omega-3s, essential fatty acids, whatever, has some small benefit. But you, definitely not like a main treatment, but it's an easy thing to kind of add in. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, I'm totally fine with people trying whatever they want to try before they make that decision to try medication. And often the reasoning is like, look, what could it hurt? And on the one hand, maybe not anything. I mean, the problem with some supplements is what it says on the bottle is not necessarily what's in the pill, because that 
industry is incredibly unregulated and there's a lot of lobbying that goes into not being regulated. So on the one hand, you don't know what you're getting in it. And just because it's natural does not make it safe. I mean, you could put a turkey sandwich out in the sun for seven hours and it's still natural turkey. And now there's a lot of other naturally occurring things in that turkey sandwich. I don't think any of you are going to want to eat it. Or as an even better example, dog poop is 100% natural. And yet, I don't see anyone having any more exposure to it than they have to, right? So natural is not safe. Trying something natural, assuming it has zero positive or negative effect, on the one hand, there is indeed a cost paid for withholding effective treatment. So more weeks or months or years spent insufficiently treated, I don't know. I think there's a cost in that. More struggles, more failures, more setbacks, more negative opinion about oneself, more negative social re repercussions in terms of other kids or other adults. If we could have prevented that and we didn't, does that, does that all go out in the wash? I don't know. I wouldn't think so. I've got clients who come in, and on the one hand, they're incredibly relieved to be diagnosed. And on the other hand, some of them, I think, are justifiably pissed about the fact that they spent a lot of years that they should not have had to spend not being diagnosed, not being treated, and as you said on your breath, suffering. There are some people who say, well, I'd rather try behavioral strategies. Now, I'm a psychologist. I spend a lot of time working with clients on behavioral strategies, so there's totally a place for that. Whether you have ADHD or not, whether you take medication or not, better strategies is always a good idea. But... Sometimes, like implicit in that idea of I want to try behavioral strategies instead, implies that ADHD is really just about strategies. You know, if you had better strategies, you wouldn't have ADHD. Is really kind of like what that means. Well, not necessarily. Good strategies are great, all about it, but it's not quite that simple that good strategies are helpful, but they're not the whole picture. And ADHD is not just about not having the right habits. Now, flipping over to the other side, as much as there are some people who feel that trying behavioral treatments is kind of like less drastic or it's a safer alternative or whatever, there are other people who just like the idea of taking a pill, swallow it down, done. But Generally, the best results kind of come from a combination of both. You know, like, as I said, there's that old saying, pills don't teach skills. But the second half of that is that the right skills are easier to learn and easier to use when you got the right pills. So the combination tends to work best. So as I started in the beginning here, you know, my goal really in all, this whole thing is it's about making good decisions. You know, there's no one size fits all decision or treatment or whatever for anybody, you know, for that's going to work for everybody. So we all have our own choices to make based on our circumstances, based on our goals, based on what's important to us, based on other things going on in our lives that are going to influence what it is that we want to try, what's important to us, and what are we striving for. So as a psychologist, then, I think it's perfectly appropriate and it's you know, the right thing to do to talk with my clients about, do you want to consider medication? Is this, some, is this something of interest? Why do you want to try it? Why do you not want to try it? And to help them kind of work through this. And my hope here today for you guys, whether you're whatever brought you here, that it's helped you kind of think a little bit more broadly about this question of medication. So, um, is this the right thing? Is it not the right thing? Does it fit? Does it not fit? How do you sort of think your way through it to make really kind of like the best choice that you can for yourself, for your family, for your clients, students, patients, whatever.